I think that's the interesting part to this. If PR is done right, in my mind, it counterbalances some of the negative news that's out there.、Mm-hmm. I'm of that belief where I'm slowly consuming less and less news because it doesn't seem to be news. It just talks about all the bad things and things that we have no agency over, and it can lead to some form of anxiety and depression. Lucy, I'm excited to talk to you today because I have to tell you something. Full confession. I've had、mm, a mixed history with PR people and PR <laughs> firms and agencies. I just want to put it out there: it's not gotcha <laughs> journalism. But I want to just tell you, it's been a painful experience, and I'm, I'm going through your book and your material, and just I'm having flashbacks. It's、like、traumatic <laughs> for me. Oh no! Well,、yeah. if, if it helps, I I have been described once as the anti PR PR. So you're going to be in safe hands today. I'm not going to try and upsell like, you anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason why I wanted to have a conversation with you too was that we generally focus on marketing and branding for the podcast, and I think you're right in there with branding and marketing and PR, and it's a part of the strategy that a lot of people overlook.、Mm-hmm. It feels like PR comes from like decades ago, kind of thinking, and now we can have these relationships with people on social media. But there's a lot of valid stuff that you talk about. I want to dig into that. So, for people who don't know who you are. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your backstory? Yeah, sure. So my name is Lucy Werner, and short version, really, I'm a nobody that just helps people become somebody. <laughs> Longer version,、um, I guess when I was growing up, I used to watch Superman, and I wanted to be Lois Lane. Like I wanted to be a journalist so bad, and then、um, I kind of lost the confidence in writing. It got knocked out of me at school. I wasn't academic enough. And then at seventeen, I did a work experience placement at a PR agency, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" I just didn't know jobs like this existed.、Um, and it was for music PR at the time. This is when I was like faxing press releases and walking press coverage around to the Sony offices,、um, and that was it. My love for publicity and PR and all things kind of promotion started. And two decades later, here I am、um, now running my own PR consultancy and teaching other small business owners, predominantly like creative entrepreneurs, really how to do PR for themselves. I love that.、Uh, you are not old enough to know about fax machines and Rolodexes, but you write about this. So like, <laughs> my, I used to have、saying. a Rolodex. I did have a Rolodex. My first job. I did、job. too. <laughs> it was it was the thing of beauty, and and I mention it to people like, you mean Rolex? No, I mean Rolodex. <laughs> you guys heard of this thing? Yeah, it's like a artifact from the '90s, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. You would roll, you would rotate it, and all your business cards would be on it. In fact, the first journalist that I used to phone nonstop was like my first bank password because I knew his <laughs> his direct line so much. Okay, this is some form of like outdated, antiquated technology explaining. You heard a man explaining. Now we have to literally describe to you old tech that doesn't exist. Yeah, you'll make up a term for this, right? Yeah, direct lines don't exist anymore either because we're all just on mobile. <laughs> right,、It's、things, technologies that are going away. Okay, well, let's get into the serious part. I mean, you, what a nerd! I'm just going to tell you, you're like 17. You're saying this is the most exciting thing, doing music PR. Tell me more about why that was so exciting to you. I mean, mate, at the time, first of all, I didn't realize there were jobs where you could wear jeans and trainers to the office, so that was a revelation to me. Um, I used to come home with like bags of CDs, like bags, bags, of CDs, old-fashioned things that we used to listen to music on.、Um, <laughs> and I, you know, my job was to get press along to events and to watch musicians and to watch artists. And then it was kind of like a lot of it was just grabbing articles online, and hence the printing out and the fa- the faxing of things.、Um, and it was just amazing. I just didn't realize there was this way of Promoting people and their sort of stories, and and actually, I think like my love at the time was also in music. So for me, I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm getting to see all these musicians and meet all these musicians, and and I, but I was just there on sort of the sidelines, assisting to to get what they they were doing out there, and it felt like a superpower. Okay, I take it back. Hanging out with a bunch of musicians and writing about it and living this life and going to concerts or events and venues, 
that sounds pretty cool. Was that part yeah. of your job? Yeah. And I was like 17. I was in London. So I was commuting like back and forth from like the, the tiny village I grew up in to London in the, in the United Kingdom. And we, our offices were in Soho. I'd, I'd spend like breaks in like the Sony offices, hanging out with A&R people. I was just like, wow. Like it just, it blew my mind that me, this tiny little person from nowhere, just from this work experience, I ended up keeping my placement all summer and just thinking like, yeah, this is, this is the job for me. Okay. Where does this job lead you? Take us to the next major milestone in your timeline. So I did, did the university, did media and culture studies, and then came out and actually I didn't have the connections. I didn't have anybody in my life that was in media or communications or culture. So I had a bit of a, a weird kind of career path to get, to get there, but I basically landed a job as a team assistant, so sec, basically a secretary um, in an advertising agency in the PR department. So then I did two years for Leo Burnett in London. It's a big global ad agency um, and learned loads about advertising and creatives. And that's probably where my love for sort of the creative world came from, because I was sort of sat in these big open London offices, seeing teams of creatives like pitching for ad campaigns. And again, like that was an education in itself. So that was huge. And then I moved in-house um, to a, boot a luxury boutique travel company called Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And then I moved into PR agency land. Um, and at that time, I did a lot of consumer brands, uh, but a lot of agencies as well, loads of marketing agencies, creative agencies, ad agencies. So that kind of creative theme was, was always there. And then in 2014, I had kind of hit this point where I was like, I'm just upselling to the clients and bringing more projects in and I'm making my CEO richer um, and my salary is staying the same. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm into this anymore. <laughs> um, so there was that. And there was also this thing that if you want to work with a PR agency, typically, if you're working with a well-known or reputable one, you're looking at like a minimum, minimum of like three to $5,000 a month. And even then you're probably the lowest payer. So you're getting the least attention. And I was meeting all these cool entrepreneurs who had these amazing stories, but when they were starting out, they didn't have the budget to spend three grand a month telling their stories. And I basically left to work um, with this amazing founder and kind of jumped ship and had three months savings in the bank and was like, right, I've got you know three months to cover my cost of living. I was like, I've got three months to make this work or I'll go back into agency land or freelancing. And after three months, I'd hired like employee number two and the Wern agency was born Um and the rest is history, as they say. But actually now, like, um, you know, along the journey, my husband got made redundant when I was pregnant with baby number two. So he wasn't going to qualify for pat leave. So I was like, come on in. So he started like the branding and creative division. And then really in the pandemic, we kind of pivoted quite a lot um, to work on this platform, hypeyourself.com. So now we really work a lot on people who have zero money, um, and zero budget and zero clue to demystify the process. Um, I always say the equivalent myth in PR for like branding is like people think you need to start in branding with a logo, right? <laughs> and you spend most of your time trying to explain to them why you don't start with a logo. And for me in PR, the equivalent is don't start with a press release. And I have to explain to them why PR is so much more than just a press release. <laughs> um, so there's similar kind of myths there. Um, but it's always been in the kind of the creative community that I love the most because I think they've just got a, so there's something in their souls that's different to everybody else. Earlier, I alluded to my traumatic past with PR agencies and people. And I think it's because I have this Hollywood version in my mind that's been playing from the films that I've consumed where there's this PR person who can get you anywhere and do anything <laughs> yeah. and they, they leverage one relation for another and they're hustling and they're bustling and they just make stars out of normal people. Like you said, you're nobody that helps people to become a somebody, right? Or something like that. And it doesn't work like that. And, or maybe we're not at that level. 
I think it's changed. I think, um, you know, in the heyday, a little bit like with my first sort of days in advertising, there was a lot more like boozy lunches and it was like who you know and who you could connect with. Right. And social media has changed that. Like anybody can reach out to a journalist on social media now. You don't need a roller text with their direct line anymore to, to hit a journalist. You can find out who's writing stories online. There's, you know, there's digital media. And also I think publicity media relations is just one strand of PR. PR is public relations. It's everything you are doing in the public eye. So that is how you talk to somebody at an event and end up sitting next to them and then being able to go on their podcast. It is, um, you know, how you respond to somebody in a coffee shop when they open the door for you. Like you never know what opportunity is going to help you in the future. And I think People think PR is all about who you know and getting on the front page of a newspaper. And I'm always like, you know, take a step back and actually think about like, what is your business objective and where is your audience? And then tailor your PR around that rather than it being the, it's just who you know thing. And I think actually it's a lot, it's a mistake that a lot of CEOs come to me with, which they're like, you know, who's on your black book? Who have you got connections with? And I'm like, what's your story? <laughs> because if your story is rubbish, it doesn't matter who I do or don't know. I'm not going to be able to place it. It doesn't matter how, how many favors I think I've got in the bank. It's just not going to happen. Right. Okay. So maybe this is where we shift in the conversation. And I'm going to do this in a mostly selfish way. <laughs> but I'm thinking that there are going to be a lot of people who are probably in my shoes, maybe have gone through this or are about to go on this journey too. My history is that I used to run a design company. We made commercials and music videos for some of the biggest bands and brands in the world. And when we worked with PR, it was like a pretty boilerplate template. They would send it out and we'd get lots of hits online, a couple of trade pubs, but we never really cracked into what I would consider at least mainstream pubs for us. And it was a struggle, but I get it because oftentimes, and I think you talk about this, the the press release was like, here's a project, here's something cool, please talk about us. And there was not really a human interest story. There was not really good storytelling being done. Mm -hmm. I get that. I accept that. So the, those days are behind me. But now I run this education company. I'm trying to make a difference in the world. I'm trying to take on big education, if you will. And I think this is a story worth telling. And I'm trying to do something that impacts people's lives. And, and I'm thinking, how come I can't get any PR? <laughs> I'm trying to do something good here, but help me out. <laughs> so we're going to workshop you as as a yeah. live. Okay, so let's, let's start with let's think of yourself like a magazine, right? So historically, um, your news would have been the campaigns you worked on, and now your news might be um, I'm coming to do a tour in Europe in 2023. So right yep. then, so when you've got the magazine, you start with the news, and typically like. Okay, like the news is fun, but it's not necessarily going to generate coverage. Um, you need a bit more. So then you've got kind of like the features. So that's maybe where you're spotting a trend. So we could go, do you know what? There's kind of this new creative education momentum happening globally. Chris is one of them. Here's two other people. Maybe we, we, we take Shakara, a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody else internationally, and we go, right, there's three. So it's not just me, there's a trend. So then it starts to become a bit more interesting because we're like, everybody talks about the creator economy and how much content creators can make. We're all talking about the shift towards having personal brand and digital. There's a cost of living crisis. People are having to seek out new careers. There's all these different sort of things that we can hook off so we need to have that, like, why now? Like, why is this important now? So that would be a kind of, we would sort of look to start delving into features in your perspective and maybe somebody that combats that. Maybe there's somebody really expensive that we pit you against that's actually like, actually, I don't think this type of education is good. This more formulaic education that actually costs 50 grand and takes you 10 years to complete is much better. We can pit you against each other, that sort of thing. Then you have like what you call like the opinion or thought leadership pieces. Actually, you could be penning a piece and pitching it to nationals. Like maybe there's something happening in government where they're talking about education. Um, obviously, a lot of my references are UK based because that's where 
where I'm at, but there's all, there's quite often a lot of talk like recently how small businesses are suffering in the budget or um, how students are coming out of university and they're not actually getting the education they need when it comes to life, like managing their finances. So it could be when there's a report or something happens in the news like that, that you're going, ah, do you know what? I've actually got an opinion on that. And you pitch a thought leadership article in response. Then there's like my favorite bit, which is what I would call the equivalent of your horoscope or recipe pages, like the fun bits. So I was thinking about um, your personal brand and you don't give huge amounts away, but you give little bits every now and again. So, um, you know, you might talk about your age or you, I saw you, I think it was on Instagram. You shared something the other day about how your teenagers wanted to take over your account. And I was thinking, do you know what? Wouldn't it be an interesting PR story if you did let your teenagers take over your business for a certain period of time as an experiment to see what happened and then reported on that? Because you don't see, you might see founder stories of founders working with uh, children, but you don't see them doing it as a kind of social experiment to see what happens. Um, I'm not trying to do, derail your business, by the way. <laughs> Or, or give them ammunition to make this dream for themselves happen. But it was just, it's like those little nuggets where you, that you give out. You think that's actually really interesting. We could do something with that. And I think a good PR will sit down with you and say, that idea you had is terrible or, or this idea is quite good. Let's dig a bit more into this idea. Um, but for you, it's, I think it's definitely looking at upcoming news, like dates, reports, budget, things that are happening in your creator um, economy education space that you be can become the sort of the voice of. And once you've done it for a while, then you become the go-to. So it's actually the hardest bit is building the momentum and getting those first relationships in, in place. Um, a technique that I often use is if there's a particular theme or an area you want to own, Google. It's like your best friend. You can literally Google like, and find who are the 10 journalists that are always writing about these sort of subject matters. Invite one of those journalists onto your podcast. You know, check them on Twitter every day. Create a Twitter list that's just those 10 journalists. Engage their content. Share their articles. Become you know somebody that's a fan of their work genuinely um, and then start pitching to them. And I guess it's likening it a little bit the pitching to journalists is a little bit like when somebody blind pitches you on LinkedIn. You know, when you get a connection and they're immediately like, hey, and you know if they've studied your work at all or if they're just pretending to be a super fan or if it's just a completely terrible fit. And I don't think there's any shame in like cultivating a relationship as a fan as long as it's genuine and, and it's not a transaction. Like you're actually trying to give something of benefit. And with what you're doing, I think there is that bigger purpose piece that works very well. I just think you need the right news hook at the right time with the right person. Okay. This is exciting for me. <laughs> well, you know, so, I, you know, full disclosure here, uh, your background is in writing, your love for writing and journalism. And so I feel like you'd like to talk about writing, but for designers, the idea of writing and pitching stories is like, ah. Uh, it's so painful. I know I can do it, but I don't want to. There's resistance that I'm feeling. But you're not, you, you, you don't have to write anything other than his sort of three bullet points. Like if, think about people who are pitching to you, right? Like you yeah. probably had some terrible pitches for people to oh, collaborate yeah. with you. So you tell me like what makes a good pitch stand out from a bad pitch? Oh, I like this. Okay. Well, first I would say when you first talk to me, don't pitch me. Okay. And and please do your homework, know something about me, find the common area of interest as an opening to have a conversation. I know that whenever somebody reaches out, they want something that's natural. I'm not faulting you for wanting something, but you know, buy me lunch first, like figuratively speaking, don't just try to sleep with me on the first moment. It's, just, <laughs> it's too much. It's just too much. Like hire me. I'm like, I don't even know who you are. Give me a job, uh, refer me, uh, uh, boost my post. Uh, it's all these requests and there's no rapport being built. Mm -hmm. That That's usually where it goes wrong. But then somebody will ask a question and maybe offer something to me that is helpful. Mm -hmm. I think so, that's like a relationship that begins on the right foot. 
So do you think sometimes maybe you've had fans of yours who you've seen engage with your content for a long time? So then if they ask, it doesn't feel as awkward for you because you think, you know what, they've, they've supported me for a long time. Absolutely. And they don't even have to ask because then I'll start noticing them. And here's, here's how my brain works. On LinkedIn, if you comment something thoughtful and you're there a lot, I will then say like, why don't, why aren't I connected to you? And then I click on your profile and it looks like there's been this stale connection request that's been sitting there uh, because there's so many I haven't gone through. <laughs> so I accept that. So the, the conversation begins. I'm inviting you now to have a dialogue with me. Mm -hmm. And then when people are pitching to you, are they sending you long pieces of praise or is it quite often just a couple of bullet points? Good. Yeah, I see where you're getting and where you're going with this. The ones that send me blocks of copy, I, I, I don't even look at. It just shocks my system. Like, I don't have time for this right now. It could be the most beautiful, most helpful thing that anybody's ever written, but my brain goes into complete overwhelm mode. So I want two, three words, a couple of bullet points. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. So how do you think you're going to pitch to a journalist? <laughs> <laughs> this is the trap. <laughs> and then you're just like, hey, what's that over there? And it closes on my foot. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. But what I was going to say was <laughs> I'm in this place in my life where and maybe many people listening to this are like, great, I can go to your website and learn how to do this, right? Mm -hmm. But I'd rather just spend my money and hire somebody like you to do this for me. Yeah. Is that crazy? No, that's not crazy. Um, I think generally speaking, I think boutique agencies and freelancers are the route, or you say route, don't you? The route to go down? The route, yes. The route. Um, I think freelancers are great. Um, I think there's a risk sometimes that an artist will only work with a PR that works with artists or a design agency only works with PRs that reps design agencies. And the problem with that is then sometimes it, you do get a bit siloed and you do only get the trade coverage and you're not sort of thinking out of the box. Um, I always kind of like to straddle like both like the B2B world, so the trade press and, and the B2C, so like the consumer media, um, because that would help me to do things differently. So that would help me to take like a creative agency and put it in the front end, like in the news section. Um, so like an example, I worked with a creative agency who had a dog in the office. In those days, it was revolutionary. It's obviously not now. And we did a piece of research on um, having pets in the office and creativity. And then that ended up in the front section of newspapers. Um, there was another agency, a creative agency I worked with where we were talking about the clocks going back um, and how you like lose an hour of, of daylight of daylight. So we started to do a piece of research that was basically saying like we were losing all these hours of cre creativity from the clocks going back and did a sort of wired piece about that. So I think there's these kind of like news hooks that you can find. I think the pets one, it worked because it was like National Pet Week or something. And then we had the daylight saving one. Having somebody else to bounce ideas around of like general like water cooler moments and chats in your office and to extract that and do it for you, I think is super helpful. Um, so I'm definitely not against agencies. I just worry that when sometimes when you get an agency of a big size, you end up getting a junior put on your account who doesn't know how to pitch to a journalist or even um, advocate for your business. Like really your PR person should be like your right hand person. They need to know how you speak, how you're going to respond, what you want to talk about, what you don't want to talk about. Um, they at least need to have an idea. And, and towards the sort of end of me really working with clients, I was on WhatsApp with them all. So I'd be like, do you want to talk about this? Yes, no. Right, you send me an audio note and I'll type it up and, and make it tidy for you. And really I was shaping their words. That's quite unusual. Like most PR agencies, they're either like writing something for you and then it's a risk that they don't capture your tone of voice or it's not, not quite right or not even very newsworthy. Um, but I also think you want somebody who's going to challenge you. And I think a lot of PR agencies, they just want to take the money. They don't want to necessarily make the CEO angry by saying, yeah, do you know what? I think your opinion's a bit boring. Let's, let's do something a bit different. It's a tricky spot for sure. 
Yeah, well, I imagine it that somebody will do the required research, consume a couple of pieces of content, and then have a couple of conversations, interview you, kind of figure out where the interesting stories might be, mm. and then guide you along that process, potentially interview you and say, look, here's the first draft. Why don't you take a look at it, insert what you need, and then through a couple of rounds of that, then the whatever story, the pitch is ready to go out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could it work like that? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think um I would be very nervous about working with anybody who's like, let's just do a press release and we're gonna send it out to our database. That's what I call like spray and pray, yeah. which is like basically just spam. Um and actually I talk quite a lot about how I get coverage from my clients or for myself without a press release. Um sometimes like I've I've done like articles where I break it down where I'm like, this is literally what I wrote in the email observe no press release <laughs> mm. because it's it's really right what we were saying it's about the bullet points of interest the quick intro like and the why now bit i think that's the bit that most people miss this having an interesting story is one bit but it's you need to be answering the question of why is that relevant to their readership now <laughs> like can they do it next week next year yeah. if you can give a news hook Whatever that hook is, however tenuous it is, that's always going to help. Okay. So uh, I, I just want to put this out there in case somebody's listening to this, like, Chris, why do you need PR? You have your own channel and audience and, and the days of PR are, have, have evolved massively because of social, right? My main motivation is to get verified on Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, wherever you can get verified because there are a lot of spam accounts that pretend to be me. Mm. And they're DMing people and I don't want that. So the way I can prevent that is, according to the right requirements, is to be published by mainstream press. They are like link to us articles that verify you are who you say you are. Mm -hmm. That's my main motivation. That's the only reason because I don't necessarily need more press. Right. So that's why I just want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, a quick one that we can do for you off the bat. Um, there is, I think I tagged you, um, on a Forbes contributor on Twitter a while back, just after I met you. Um, there is a Forbes contributor who writes about entrepreneurship called JD Cook. There's lots of contributors on Forbes. And let me tell you something about Forbes, right? Um, the contributors have to provide a certain number of stories and they are looking for story angles. Um, quite often there's stuff going on with them. Jodie and I did a workshop together for free where she was talking about how she wants to be pitched to. She has a website. On her website, she has a form. And if you have an idea for an opinion piece or an article for her about entrepreneurship, she invites you to submit your idea there. It's very bullet point based. Um, so anybody who's got a bit of an idea for an article can pitch. But she also does this other lovely thing where she uses the hashtag journey request, which is quite UK based. There is some rest of world media using it, but hashtag journey request um, is basically when a journalist puts out a request for information. So she will say, what was the worst piece of mentoring advice you've ever had or the best piece of mentoring advice you've ever had. And you can literally just respond to her Twitter thread and then she'll take the ones that she likes and uses it as an article. So twice I've been featured in Forbes because of Jodie, because I've responded to her Twitter request. Three times I've secured coverage for clients because I've used the form. Even though she's my friend, I won't use her email address because she has specifically said that she likes to receive her her um, column request through this form and you submit an idea like that. So that's just one. There, I think there's something like 25,000 Forbes contributors who talk about all different types of things from entrepreneurship, design, creativity, you, know, you name all the different things, NFTs, blockchain, crypto, like whatever your jam is, there is probably a contributor for Forbes writing about it. Find them, become friends with them, pitch to them, and that's an easy one piece for you right there for your verification. Love it. Well, you, you write about this in the book <laughs> about how you scrape magazines and things that you like and you tear sheets out and then you create a database. You're very scientific about it, their name, <laughs> contact. And you said the next thing you should do is try to see if they're on Twitter. 
Mm. Uh, because they will most likely tell you where and how they want to be talked to. So this mm-hmm. is the strategy that you just demonstrated right now, right? Mm. Yeah, most journalists will have said publicly how they want to be approached and what stories they're looking for. And, and that's why as well, if you if you actually start with, but where do I want to be? So for you, like you could be featured anywhere, but you might go, okay, actually like there's, there's five specific publications I want to be in. Okay, great. You've picked your five. Now, which desk? <laughs> Like, is it the news desk? Is it the opinions desk? Is it the features desk? Um, For me, like one of my favorite publications um, is called Courier Magazine. It's a modern business publication. Historically, I found business publications very dry. It was like LinkedIn back in the day, like very kind of corporate and suity. Um, And Courier Magazine came along and I think really shook it up. They featured a lot of startups and small businesses in creativity. They had different themes. And they they have the news pages, they have features pages, they have workshops. So if you've got a specific problem, um, they have letters pages, they have opinion pages, they do live events. Um, There's so many different ways. So when somebody says to me like, oh, I want to be in Courier Magazine, I'm like, great, which section? And then they'll be like, oh, uh," and you're like, have you read it? Have you read it? (laughs) And I think it's always that thing of um, definitely dream big and set goals for yourself. But before you know, before you actually can think that's going to happen for me, you need to start taking those connecting steps. Um, You know, the amount of times I meet entrepreneurs and they're like, I want to do a Ted talk. And I'm like, cool, what on? And then, Oh, I don't, I don't know. And I'm like, you you have a message that you need to share with the world on the TEDx platform, but you're not sure what that is. And they're like, "Uh," like, think about what you want your talk to be on. Then start looking for the local TEDx producers in your area and connect with them on LinkedIn. You know, start saying that you're a speaker, start showing evidence on on video. And that can just be on, you know, IG lives or Facebook lives. It doesn't, you don't have to start off on a main stage in in the real world um, to demonstrate that you can speak and you've got a good perspective. Okay, very helpful. I have to ask you this question. They say that uh, to be a good writer, you have to read. I'm just curious, are you an avid magazine reader? <laughs> I, yeah, I am. I am. And that is probably like, that probably does stem from like the childhood journalist thing in me. Like when I was a kid, there used to be a, a newspaper called the Fun Day Times that was a supplement in the Sunday Times. Um, and then we had like a TV show over here where you could be part of like the press pack. Um, so yeah, I've always kind of enjoyed news and um news and 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 reading and for me i like i like finding the quirky stories <laughs> like i like finding the weird I, I don't adhere to this whole like you shouldn't watch the news because it's all terrible like i think i don't know if it's because i've been doing it for like two decades but i kind of have this sort of filter where i sort of flick through all of that and i'm like oh look at this long read about somebody who bought a house and the former owner actually did some really bad things and now there's this whole piece about former haunted houses um or like you know like all kinds of sort of random stories that that come out um one of my favorite requests i've ever seen from a journalist is actually around christmas time being like we're looking for case studies of anybody who has a annual reunion at christmas that they um sorry an annual ritual they do every christmas with their cat and i just thought for some person out there this is going to be brilliant press coverage and it's just an unusual quirky thing um so yeah i do love reading but today the news is not just long form words it's video it's online content so if reading is not your jam like my husband is french and severely dyslexic so he does not read any news but he still gets his in his in the sort of video bite-sized nuggets in different ways yeah I mean, I do read. I just don't think, uh, and I use my my consumption habits have changed a lot. In that, I used to subscribe to probably twenty magazines, and now I subscribe to one. <laughs> and I don't think I'm alone in this. And that print is going a certain direction, and we're having the conversations online because it's more immediate. We can sit down. I like to read books too. So, my familiarity with what desk you should be on. It doesn't register because I'm not reading in that format anymore. Yeah, yeah. But don't you think there's this tiny bit of, like we all have a tiny bit of slow living in all of us as well. So it might be that we listen to records or it might be 
that we do journaling or it might be that we go on like creative walks or something like most of us have something about us that's slow living and so for me the sitting down with the magazine it's not just it's not it's it isn't just work for me it's like my that's like my space <laughs> No, I, I 100% agree with you. And if you were to look at the cases and cases of magazines that I've collected over the years and have slowly purged my <laughs> wife, pulling them from my hands, <laughs> saying, let go, it's, a, it's an antiquated form because um, these days we're, we're about like what's happening right now, quite literally, not what happened three months ago that somebody wrote about. Mm -mm. Um, but I still do miss those, uh, that slow living style of consumption and creation that I want to find those human interest stories that you talk about. That's why I appreciate the one magazine that I've subscribed to is Wired because they do go deep on a couple of things. I'm like, that is such a strange story about murder and the internet and hacking and how the web figured out a problem yeah. the police could not. Their lens is always stories through the, uh, through the, uh, there's stories through the lens of technology. So it's always kind of an interesting hook point for me. But see, I feel like if you went to Wired and said, you're the only magazine that I'm subscribed to, I would love to like do a guest edit for you on any topics around one, two, three, four, five bullet points. I'm sure they'd be like, okay, Chris, like, it's not like you're not like famous enough to kind of ask those questions to those sort of publications, you know, like mm -hmm. if, if anybody who hasn't got any kind of sizable following or business structure to get into magazines, then when there's somebody like you who does have a following, I think it's, it's just pitching it in the right way <laughs> okay all right that that's is, a clue for me your, to figure this out this is your challenge i think 2023 yes. has to be the year of chris in wired magazine <laughs> i would love that and and one day get my check because i can't get my verification check. <laughs> yeah that's all i wanted for really okay ultimately. okay yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I, I love this line that you write helping founders get famous and your story i think started I think you said in 2014 mm. when when you found somebody, a founder of a company that you thought, look, there's these big agencies, you get lost in a shuffle, you get somebody who's like third tier writer, journalist, you're not getting top shelf and you're paying a lot for it. And so you find this niche and then you're doing this. So I'm just curious of all the different things that you do. Can you just break it down for me, the different entities, what percentage of your time is consumed with each thing that you do and where you... Where you make your money from now i would say my time is predominantly split on doing more of the diy stuff and more on the support and helping people so i typically take on a maximum of three to five clients a year normally it's somebody i know quite well and i like which is also dangerous because i get really emotionally attached to it and then i i can't sleep at night until i've done the best job that i can do for them it's really dangerous um but it's a really lovely lovely place to be um but that's probably it used to be 100% of my time is just doing client work and i would say now it's probably less than 20% client work is probably like less than 20% of our mm. revenue mm -hmm. um I work a lot with universities and creative accelerators. So I do a lot of guest workshops um, and guest um, guest appearances. <laughs> 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 um, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> I am a pretty big deal in these universities <laughs> in London. Um, <laughs> no, you have to say that with your pinky in the air or something. I know, with my, yeah. I've actually got my cup of tea here. So I can, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, um, and especially kind of, um, there's a few sort of um, social enterprises that I work for where they're supporting um, marginalized women, um, like founders coming through. So for me, um, that isn't, you know, my biggest fee payer, but it's probably the work that gives me the biggest joy because there's just something really lovely about helping sort of emerging founders coming up and then giving them a piece of advice or a tip and then seeing them land like a massive brand deal or a huge piece of press coverage to themselves. It's like, it's the best feeling. Um, and then I started to kind of like dip more, I guess, into like the online course world and the, and the teaching side for myself. So actually, I, I guess my biggest pivot kind of came um, when my second son was born. He was actually born with four rare congenital heart defects. And so for the first seven months of his life, it was really... Um, touch and go and the small business community at that time 
just rallied around me and supported me. And it just made me feel even more that the small business community was where I belonged. And it's where I wanted to kind of give back to. Like, I think somebody set up like a, a, a coffee, like round up for me being like, if Lucy was in a corporate office, people would have put money in an envelope or a jar, but she's not, she's like a sole founder. So they, people were like, you know, spending three pounds, like buying me a coffee and stuff. And it meant I could buy my like lunch from the hospital that day and stuff. It was, it was really super cool. So that was kind of when I really kind of started to go all in on the, the DIY side of stuff. Um, and you know what it's like, like you're suddenly like, oh my God, there's billions of people and I need to like find a way to help them, but also, you know, monetize this so I can still keep the lights on and, and pay my, pay my bills. So I'm still kind of on the road to, figuring that out and and along the way um I do a lot of work now with like Adobe Express I'm like one of their ambassadors which is actually how I met you because they flew me out to um Adobe Max um so I'm doing a lot of kind of content creation where I teach people via brands how to promote themselves so it's all really linked to hyping yourself and building your brand and promoting yourself um uh, but now there's kind of these bigger companies who are like championing the underdogs and I'm getting to partner with them in that way. And so for me, there's this real beauty that for years, I was like, I'm just a small person. I'm just a small fish in a big pond. I'm not famous. I don't have millions of followers, um, but I can still get brand opportunities, which I definitely didn't even dream of being possible for me when I started out on this road. Um, so yeah, it's for me, it, it keeps me motivated to keep championing others because I'm like, you never know who's watching you. You never know who's on your Instagram stories. You never know. Like some of the best um, speaker opportunities I've had has been because somebody came along to like a free Zoom talk I did in the pandemic or something. Um, so this constantly like taking your small consistent steps in hyping yourself and what it is that you stand for um, has really kind of worked <laughs> worked out for me now um so yeah i'd say probably like 50 percent of my time now is the teaching and workshops by my math that's only 70 percent. yeah so hold on so we got like 20 percent agency 50 yes. percent teaching and workshops and then yeah probably 30 is the brand partnerships okay like brand yeah brand stuff and then i guess in that in the in that um I obviously I've got, I've had two book deals along the way. So I, I have, I'm with a small publisher, so I, I do okay on royalties, like not great. Um, but you know, the book has also been a platform, um, but it's all kind of like lump, <laughs> lumped in together. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about your working with brands and being a brand ambassador. How did this come about and how do you integrate this into what you do? Mm -hmm. So about, Two and a half years ago, I was followed by a marketing person from Adobe on my Instagram. It was their personal account. So I was like, I'm not going to be like, hey, what's... I just remember thinking at the time, that's an interesting follow mm. and nothing much else. And then he reached out um, and we had an email um, chat and then we ended up sort of meeting online and he started to tell me that Adobe Express were bringing out this product for people who weren't necessarily designers, um, but to kind of make creativity accessible for everyone. And I was like, I love this because I work with my husband and I have to get him to basically create a lot of my design assets for me. And that can be quite stressful on the relationship when obviously his priority is clients, not my stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm the I'm the PR, I'm the face of the business. I'm the new business generator. So if I'm not communicating, um, so anyway, I started like having a little tinker on express and I was like, ah, oh, he creates all my assets for me in Photoshop and InDesign puts them in express for me. And now I can just make everything myself. So I basically, um, the whole, my whole shtick is like, I can divorce my husband now. <laughs> <laughs> The because, fool. Why would he do that? Because now I have he's a, made himself obsolete <laughs> like the Rolodex. Yeah. <laughs> so um yeah, Adobe Express means like now I can do all these branding stuff for myself. And it's a bit like I don't think it I still need I still need him. Like we still sit down every six months and do our like brand strategy. I mean in life as well, obviously. Um Father yeah. of your children, you know. Co founder of the children, still. it would be a real pickle. <laughs> yeah. Uh <laughs> 
It would be a pickle um, for sure, especially as yeah. I've just moved to France to try out living there and he's the only fluent French speaker at the moment. So yeah, I digress. Um, so yeah, uh, they were like, we've got this ambassador platform. I, one of the things that I love about it is it's super transparent. It doesn't matter if you have a million followers or a thousand followers. It's like, this is the challenge. If you want to do it, it's the paid for opportunity. Everybody's paid the same. You just interpret it as you want. You submit your idea and then like you go. <laughs> And that's it. Mm -hmm. You you post it, you're paid. Um, but also Adobe Express partner with a lot of platforms that I've partnered with already in the UK. So over here, there's a platform called Enterprise Nation, um, which again, sort of champions like entrepreneurs coming through. So I, I got to do some judging work on some, um, like it was, a, there was a competition. So I was got to be like a judge on, on that. Um, there's been some other sort of bigger I guess, influencers over here who've got partnerships with Express and I kind of come on as the Express ambassador to like teach a workshop or really just talk about like PR and personal brand, but how you can use Adobe Express to enhance that. Um, like you've probably not got to this bit of the book yet, but there's a bit where I really talk about the headshot and how important it is and the amount yeah. of founders that I've like worked with. Where I'm like, send me a headshot. And it's like, the CEO is like stood against the back of a toilet door or something. <laughs> and, and then even then you're like, but just crop it, just crop the rub, just crop the rest of it out. It's easy. Um, and Adobe Express is like great for doing something like that. But historically you would have needed a designer to sit there and cut and crop you out. And, you know, now you just click remove background and you're off. Yeah. I've used it too. So it's interesting. I, I might be a little bit of a design snob and you're the person who's probably married to the design snob. Yes. And Express, <laughs> right. Express allows both of us to create pretty quickly on our mobile. And yeah. To get really custom looks quickly. I, I'm also, uh, I, I guess, a, an Adobe Express ambassador at some point too. So I just <laughs> want to put that out there in case they're like, this just turned into a commercial for Adobe Express. It's not intentional. No. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I, I just had one other quick question with uh, for you in, in that well, when we bumped together in that back conference room at mm. Adobe Max, there was a moment there where the room got really emotional. Yeah. And I felt it. And I want to bring it up and get your perspective on it before we kind of go back to like PR land here, which is somebody had said, I don't remember who it was, when they looked around the room, they were very encouraged by the diversity that was represented in the room from men, women, non-binary, queer, uh, people of color. Mm -hmm. It was a really good room. Mm -hmm. And I felt something. I've, I I got kind of choked up a little bit just realizing that as well. I, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think part of why I, I do do what I do is, is to try and champion people who don't necessarily get those opportunities. So for me, you know, kind of one of the values that I try and champion is, um, you know, equality and not always to the best of my own abilities, because I've obviously come up from like my own kind of like white middle-class privileged background. So I have to constantly auto-correct myself all the time where I'm not like getting it right. But it's really nice for me to, to work with a big brand who talks about um, creativity and accessibility for everybody and it seems genuine. It's not there. There wasn't photographs in that room. Like the room you're talking about, it wasn't even advertised. It was very low key. It was kind of like an invite only to the ambassadors um, of, of, the pro, of the various programs. And yeah, you could even see like when I was having separate, just Adobe Express ambassador meetups where there was 70 of us, just the reflection of the different types of talent globally, it was so impressive and I think more companies need to be working with diverse talent from from a kind of younger demographic and actually even with um, Express the age demographic as well they're not just getting Gen Z there were there was you know it was Gen Z there was uni students there but there were other people in the room yet who were like 10 20 years older than me as well and that felt quite inspiring too because sometimes I think oh gosh like am I going to start to hit my shelf life soon because I'm not this young whippersnapper coming through and I've, I'm not you know I'm not a Forbes 30 under 30 and um you know I that those days are long gone for me um so yeah that um that did feel really special and it felt really unique and 
it's actually been the first time I went to any kind of live event like that of that size since the pandemic. And I came back and I was so like my creativity muscle was so flexed when I came back. I had a gazillion ideas of things I wanted to create and produce. Um, And I think meeting all those people definitely, definitely sort of, you know, did that. And like Torin, who was speaking, who um, we were sat listening to that day, who I think kind of started to set the, that sort of tone is just being like one of the most inspiring creators I've ever met. And that's just, you know, I only met him for like two days at a live event. And I think that's another thing about PR in a way. It's not just about getting press. It's actually about going out there and stimulating your mind and meeting people and thinking about who do I want to collaborate with? Who do I want to be seen alongside? Who am I doing this work for? And are the brands or the magazines or the people that I'm partnering with reflecting those values? I I think that's the interesting part to this. If PR is done right, in my mind, it counterbalances some of the negative news that's out there. Mm -hmm. I'm of that belief where I'm slowly consuming less and less news because it doesn't seem to be news. It just talks about all the bad things and things that we have no agency over and it can lead to some form of anxiety and depression. Mm. But where you just talked about Torn, about how PR in press and journalism could highlight these great human interest stories of people that you might not have heard about that are doing remarkable things, but no one knows. And that's where I think there's some hard hitting journalism where flying throughout the world, crawling into some unknown parts and just shining a light on somebody that wore that is worthy of being highlighted in that way. But mm. maybe that's a romanticized version of that. And it seems now the journalists are the gatekeepers, the people just submitting thousands and thousands of things about promoting a product <laughs> app launch something. <laughs> I think as um, the proliferation of digital media has grown, though, the opportunities for different niches online has grown too. So there are publications that literally only focus on positive news or positive stories um, or, you know, whatever your kind of niche is, you know, whether it's, um, you know, there's this guy, in, he's over in the UK, he's like really famous on TikTok for making train spotting cool again. And I'm like, you know, whatever your thing is, there's other people out there who's that's their thing too and they're gonna be people writing about that as as well so um yeah I just think there's still space for those credible stories to come through it's just making sure that people actually still give it a chance and don't give up at the first hurdle and I guess that's why for me there is that's a lot of the driver of me doing what I do is like reminding people like just because somebody doesn't reply to you, that doesn't mean it's a no. It just means they maybe missed it that day. And I, my, I spend most of my life getting rejected, <laughs> like not having responses to emails or being told no. And I just keep going. Okay. Let's give people something very practical to do as we're kind of landing the plane on this. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned this already, so I want to go back to it. Something that everybody who's listening to this can do today is take a look at your Headshot. Let's take a look at your bio. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you mentioned the CEO standing in front of a bathroom door. <laughs> what should the ideal headshot do or look like? Mm-hmm. So if you're watching this on YouTube or other video platforms, I'm just sort of adjusting myself on the screen here. <laughs> <laughs> you adjusted your voice too when you said that. <laughs> so I go into a teaching voice. Hello. Yeah. Um, but you do, you do kind of want to get your shoulder, your head and shoulders like centered. So you're in the middle. You don't want your head too high. You don't want to be too low down. You don't want to be licking up your chin. Um, this is also useful for people who are thinking about doing a video interview, like you know, I'm on my computer today, so it's fine. But I notice lots of people on laptops. I'm just like, put it on some books, man. <laughs> just send to your, send to your face. Um, typically, most people, when they get a headshot, they're just thinking about it in the portrait format. But I always recommend entrepreneurs to get a headshot in the landscape format because, A, if you're featured on a blog or in a newspaper, it enhances your chance of being the lead image because we are reading newspapers and in a, like a landscape page. So they normally feature a big landscape image. Or if you're reading an article online on your computer, again, it's that landscape shot. So it's been a really good trick I've used with a lot of the founders I've worked with to always submit a landscape photograph and it helps them 
you know, if you're talking about a feature and you're like, here's five entrepreneurs we've interviewed, it's going to be the one that submits the landscape photograph that gets featured. Wow. So that's my, that's my kind of hack. Insider uh, tip. Insider tip. Um, yeah. You don't need to have like a full body shot if you don't want to. Like I, I talk quite a lot about, you know, if, if you're a tailor or you work in fashion, it kind of makes sense to maybe have a few full length shots in there, but really like a simple head and shoulder shot is all you kind of need. And then on your bio, um, I kind of try and use this sort of like ABC rule. And it's the same as when you're introducing yourself as well. So you start with like your attention so you say your name slowly. People get so nervous when they're being interviewed on a podcast or when they speak on stage and they say their name really fast. So I've been Lisa Worm, Laura. So you know you have to really pronounce it, your name um, and say so the first thing your bio should say is your name and what it is that you do. Not a kind of marketing jargon bit, but, you know, very simple. Like I will quite often just say, I'm Lucy Werner and I'm a PR expert. Like I don't need to go into all the different, you know, I do about 20 different things. It's boring if you rattle all of that off. Um, so after the kind of um, the attention, then I move into like, so you've got A, attention, B, your benefits. So what's the, what's the benefit from somebody from working with you or the benefits that you give to working with somebody else? Um, and then C, so this can either be like your credentials, say how many people you've worked with, how many years experience, some awards, or it could be a call to action, like sign up to my newsletter, come to my European tour in 2023. There we go. Uh, yeah. I've given you two plugs for that now. You have. See, it's like I'm doing your PR for you already. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this comes out before 2023, otherwise it's <laughs> before the European tour. The European tour, do you know it's on a European tour? Um, yeah, you want to put your call to action or some kind of credentials on there. Try not to go over 150 words. Like it was lovely today that you asked me what I did since I was 17, but most people aren't really interested in reading about that on a, on a bio. Um, and I also think it's always worth it to think about including something a bit quirky in there. Like, the, you know, what I call showing a bit of ankle. It's not always about showing all of who you are, just like a, a little bit of your personality. I thought you said showing a little bit of your uncle. I'm like, What's my <laughs> uncle got to do with it? That is creepy and weird, but... You know, it's a bit awkward because lots of people might not even have an uncle. So that would be very <laughs> inappropriate. No, just a bit of ankle. Because like, you know, when you say the word personal brand, Brits especially yes. are like, oh, I'm so awkward. I don't want to share my personality. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to have a brand for myself. <laughs> um, it's like, no, you just need to show a tiny bit of it. It doesn't have to be what you're eating for lunch or your children or the inside of your house. It's just the equivalent of your horoscope or recipe pages like think of yourself as a magazine and what are those little fun bits that help you relate to other people like it could be a tv show like you're talking about reading or you know like what's your favorite book what's your favorite tv show and try and not put the same thing as everybody else it's so boring when we're reading the same the same quotes or yeah we're all inspired by the same people i'm like i really like people who champion like the geeks and the niche and the and the bizarre and the, and the ones that we haven't heard of. It's so much more interesting. Let's put it all together. Mm -hmm. Let's demonstrate this with you. With me? I would do it, but I can't do this in real time, everybody. I just want to say <laughs> that in case you're thinking, Chris, you should do it. I can't do it. Let's do it with you, okay? So ABC, go. Okay. Hi, I'm Lucy Werner. I'm the founder of The Wern, a PR and design consultancy. I also run HypeYourself.com, a platform for people who want to learn how to do PR and branding for themselves. I have taught hundreds of people through universities, creative accelerators, and that's, that's my credentials. And then my call to action. Um, if you want to learn more about how to do PR for yourself, you could buy my book, Hype Yourself. And if you want to learn how to do branding, I'm not the branding expert. My husband is. So we co-wrote this together. He's the, he's the brawn. I'm no, I'm the brawn. He's the brain. Uh, or follow me on Lucy Word of PR on all social media channels where I generally give out a lot of advice and behind the sort of small business scenes. Where's your ankle? 
my ankle. Oh, a little bit of fun. So sometimes somebody, I've recently just done a course with Domestica and they rewrote my bio and they showed a bit of ankle for me. So mm. they, so they, they actually, forced it on you. they forced my ankle out. <laughs> um, and they actually started with, um, like Lucy started off wanting to be a journalist um, and then discovered the world of PR through a work experience placement and hasn't looked back. So that would be like my mm, okay. That's showing. a small. That's a, that's a just little a, sliver of an ankle. Just a little. Just oh. a tiny. Yeah, but that's all you need. And yeah. then people. And then people are like, oh my gosh, I wanted to be a journalist when I was growing up too. Now come and be on my TV show. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was taking notes. You did not follow your formula exactly. <clears throat> That's so, so not gonna, true. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it with you right now. Okay, okay I'm gonna pretend to be you. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, watch, watch and learn, Lucy. Okay. My name is Lucy Werner. I'm a PR expert. Mm-hmm. I help. I'm a nobody that helps people become a somebody. Mm-hmm. And I've spoken and taught hundreds of people. I accelerated blah 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 your credentials. And at 17, I discovered blah through this. Right. <laughs> Yeah. That that's your literal exact formula. Your name? Yeah. What you do? And yeah. don't get too fancy with this and I want to ask you about this before we go. Yeah. People often ask me, "Chris, uh do I just describe myself as a PR expert or should I get really creative with describing myself?" What is your take on that? <laughs> go ahead, tell us what I, you really think. I, I, I don't love it when people get creative when they try and describe themselves especially in a bio, because it makes it really hard for people to understand what it is that you do and how it applies to them. So when I say I'm a PR expert, full stop, somebody can go, oh, like, do you run an agency? Do you work in house with somebody else? Do you take, do you, it leaves space for a question. But if I said, hi, I'm Lucy Werner and I am a hype machine, or, or, you know, something, if I'm playing on the title of my book or something, people are like, I don't know what that, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and then they instantly might think, well, it's not for oh. me. Mm. So okay. I think, I think there's room on your website or additional marketing materials to kind of do that. But I think when you're talking to the general public, you also don't know who you're in a room with. You don't know if it's a potential client a potential employee, a potential investor. You just don't know. So you don't want to blow it because they were, they didn't understand what it is that you do. And actually that's probably one of the biggest challenges in PR is people overcomplicating their service and offering and trying to be clever about how they, how they promote it. Like for me, yeah. there are millions of PR people that help small business owners with how to do publicity or run their own boutique consultancies. But nobody has the same like personality or way of doing things like I do it. So I don't worry too much about the fact that you could Google and find other people like me out there. Like that's, that's a good thing. Like that's right. a, that means there's a demand for that. Um, and I actually once orchestrated a panel with all of my competitive set <laughs> um, where we did like a Q and A and then we did like these um, is round tables where people basically could have a quick fire, like pick your brain to get the answer to their PR challenge. And it was amazing how all these different business owners gravitated towards different, like different people, different PR experts, because they're attracted to your personality. It's not so much your product, it's who you are. Yeah. So when it comes to your title, Mm. you want to get really creative, but if that leads to confusion versus curiosity, Mm. And you've totally screwed it up. Yeah, I, I, I would personally, I would always lean towards the kind of keeping it as simple as possible. Same here. A lot of people try to do too much in in that space, and if if you get like what, mm. that kind of ends it. And you want to be known for something, right? Yeah. And it becomes really hard to be known for something if you're trying to create a category. Like big brands spend millions over decades to own a category. <laughs> if you're an individual, don't break it. Like we can borrow from big business. Don't recreate it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Lucy, out of respect for your time, I've had a wonderful time talking to you today. <laughs> and uh, she's also known as the hype machine, everybody. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, and do your friends call you the Wern? Yeah. They do? Yeah. 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 My old friend, like my, yeah. my old, old friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back in the day. But also okay. it's really good for SEO. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. It's really Let me tell you how bright I was. I'm like, why is, why is a company called The Warren? I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> but what I like is people be like, oh, it's Lucy Werner from The Wren. <laughs> 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 or, or, Do they really? Yeah. Or auto captions is always like The Worm. And I'm like, oh, wow. I don't, you know what? Like it's, it's cool. But people remember it because, but quite often people think I'm just called Lucy Wern. Well, sometimes you get too clever. I don't mind. But it's memorable. Okay. It was a real pleasure talking to you. If people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Lucy Werner PR on all social media channels. Um, I'm probably most active on Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have any quick questions, always feel to DM. Quite often it will spark a piece of content I want to create. Are you encouraging people to DM you on Instagram? If it's for a quick question, not if it's a like completely redo my PR strategy for me, right. but it actually, for me, I find it really helpful because I'll see p specific themes that come up and then I create content around that, that then I'll be like, Hey, I made this for the 10 of you that asked about that. Perfect. And Hey, if you don't take anything else away from this episode, keep it short, keep it brief, bullet points every week at it. We either are going to understand or we're not. And that's enough, right? Mm -hmm. Don't, don't write prose here. It's not the place for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. 